tihei, tihei Māori ora. Uh, Nau te raura, naku te raura, ka ora ai te iwi. Ena mana, ena rea, e rā rakatera mā tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou ka taua. Uh, kia ora everyone, um, both those here and those um, with us on live stream elsewhere. My name is Richard Blakey. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Enterprise at the University of Otago, and it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you here tonight to the inaugural professorial lecture for Ms. Michelle Thompson Fawcett. I just want to pause, though, also. Ena mate haere haere. Hoke atu rā a kite po. To those that have passed, be at peace. And I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge the passing of one of our own University of Otago Kamatua, uh, Professor Keith Hunter, former Pro Vice Chancellor from the Division of Sciences, who passed this week. Um, just thinking of you, Keith, your waiwara is strong. Um, you will live on uh, and long uh, with us all. Um, haere mai. With that, um, welcome colleagues, visitors, members of Dunedin's community to the special occasion for us as a university, to a special occasion uh, for the Department of Geography, the Division of Humanities, Te Pautama Māori, and, prof and especially uh, Professor Michelle Thompson Fawcett, who we celebrate here tonight with her IPL. A uh, special welcome to your family, Michelle, Mark, Daisy and Jed, uh, husband and kids who are here. Uh, to all of your family who are listening uh, online, I hope, the, I hope the link is working and that this will get recorded and played back many times because it is a very, very special occasion. <laughs> it's special for us too at the university because it's a celebration of all that it means to become a professor here at the University of Otago, Te Whareiwananga o Otago. From our founding four professors, Scott, Shan, Black and Sale, we have set very high standards for ourselves and for that position. Whether someone that's appointed from afar as they were or grown from within, uh, it is attributes such as sustained excellence and leadership in two of our core activities of teaching, research and service, and a mere sustained excellence in a third that um, are requirements. One cannot compromise excellence in any of these three pillars of our pro professorial practice in order to attain this highest of status. So, and when these standards are met, it is well worth putting on the ritz, getting out our gowns, calling, on our, calling our leaders together and celebrating, which is why we are here tonight and why we will retire for refreshments and fellowship at the staff club at the end of proceedings. It's also a selfish exercise for us as academic leaders to forget about everything else that's going on in the university, forget about exam marking or other bureaucratic things that might be bothering us for the day, uh, and hear about the wonderful work and achievements of some of the finest minds. It's um, what I like to call academic spa time for some of us. Now, my job here is to um, probably get out of the way as quickly as possible, but it is on behalf of the vice chancellor who is overseas. Um, the formalities for me are to set the scene and then hand over pro to Professor Jacinta Ruru, uh, the founding chair of Te Pautama Māori, uh, Māori to introduce uh, Professor Thompson Fawcett. And then... At the end of the proceedings, I don't do anything, but I allow Professor Tony Ballantyne, the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor of the Division of Humanities, to give a vote of thanks and to lead us to the staff club. So as I've indicated already, we set very high standards for determining whether or not uh, to uh, appoint or promote a professor to this university. And in this process, we seek the views of many others. I have had the privilege to be able to see some of the things that we have had written about Michelle's status and contributions, uh, both from those explicitly writing as supporters of, of this and other nominations I've had the privilege to be aware of, and those being asked to give an impartial evidence-based view. And rather than pulling any particular individual's quotes out of um, many of many of the voluminous uh, nomination statements and, uh, and um, um, nominations that have been put together, I can draw upon some summarizing views that have come through these uh, and some, some highlights, some bullet points. Michelle Thompson Fawcett Nati Fatua is one of the most significant environmental geographers of our time. Full stop, exclamation mark. 
uh, having successfully forged a globally relevant research program intent on decolonizing the disciplines of geography and planning. Uh, also, the inquiries she poses go to the heart of identity, belonging, and social justice in place making and place managing. She increasingly draws on Te Amarama and Mataranga Māori to challenge the possibilities for sustainable urban planning. She is at the forefront internationally for valuing indigenous knowledge and critiquing theories of power and space. Her research is admired for its originality, depth of analysis, and tr transformative potential for society. Her expertise has been widely recognized and is extensively sought after, leading to many national and overseas collaborations. So with those remarks, even though I was not formally connected with your promotion, Michelle, these confirm to me the wisdom of the Vice-Chancellor in endorsing your promotion. So please accept my heartfelt congratulations on this deserved honour. And enough said from me, Katiake Ne. Uh, whereupon it is my pleasure to ask Professor Ruru now to formally introduce you and the topic of your lecture tonight. Thank you very much. So it is my great pleasure to introduce my dear colleague, Professor Michelle Thompson Fawcett. Born in Auckland of Ngāti Whātua descent, Michelle is one of the most significant environmental geographers of our time. She has successfully forged a globally relevant research and teaching program intent on decolonising the disciplines of geography and planning, posing inquiries that go to the heart of identity, belonging and social justice in knowing and managing place. Deeply influenced by what she saw around her, growing up in the expanding urban sprawl of the city, she has built a career in making sense of Aotearoa, New Zealand, a colonised place. Michelle graduated with a Bachelor of Town Planning in 1985 and gained experience as a planner at the New Plymouth City Council, Taranaki Regional Council and Manukau City Council. In the 1990s, she embarked on a postgraduate study, completing first her Masters of Planning at the University of Auckland, and then her PhD at the University of Oxford. In April 1999, her and her husband Mark moved to Dunedin, becoming a lecturer in geography at the University of Otago. Michelle has published an enormous amount of work. The tally reads something like this. More than 160 research outputs, including co-edited books, book chapters, journal articles, and conference presentations. In addition, she has written more than 30 reports for planning and policy practitioners, including Māori communities. One of my favourite pieces of her research is a co-authored seminal book entitled Tongne Tupu Ora, Indigenous Knowledge and Sustainable Urban Design that draws on Te Aumarama and Mātauranga Māori to challenge the possibilities for sustainable urban planning. Her research and teaching are admired for originality, depth of analysis and transformative potential for society. Accolades for just this year include being named the Distinguished New Zealand Geographer, the Ako Aotearoa National Award for Sustain Sustainable Excellence in Tertiary Teaching in the Kaupapa Māori category, and the John Mawson Award for Merit for Outstanding Contribution to Theory and Practice of Planning. She's also won a significant national award for her postgraduate supervision and recognition of her extraordinary role as supervisor to more than 80 thesis students, including 14 international and 14 Māori thesis students. Michelle is a generous contributor here at Otago. She's been Associate Dean Māori for Humanities and is the current Head of Department of Geography. She's been instrumental in the success of Te Pautama Māori, Otago's Māori Academic Staff Caucus, and more recently, the new University of Otago Potama Araro research theme that is promoting and facilitating new research in Māori lecturing and teaching. So I will always remember first meeting Michelle. I was a nervous new academic with eyebrows raised in welcome. She was notable as the only other Māori academic in the 10 storied Richardson building. A fact, by the way, that remains true today. 
She embraced me and instilled in me the confidence and integrity to both dream of and implement research and teaching programs and practices that made sense to us as Māori. She's been a constant mentor for nearly two decades. I know she has similarly touched the lives of many of the students and staff at Otago. She is one of the most committed and innovative teachers and researchers I know. And it is a great honour to welcome Professor Michelle Thompson Fawcett, Aotearoa New Zealand's first Professor of Geography. No my haramai, Michelle. E runga, tuia e raru, tuia e rotu, tuia e wahu, tuia e te heringa tangata. Te whare e tu nei, te nā koe, te papa e waho, te nā koe, e ngā mana whenua o tēnei rohi, tēnā koutou, e ngā rangatira, e ngā kaitiaki o te whare wānanga o Otako, tēnā koutou, um, ki te whānau i huihui nei, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko manga kiekie. <laughs> te maunga, ko waitamata, te moana, ko mahuhu o te rangi, te waka, ko rangi toto, te motu, ko ngāti whātua me ngāti teata, ngā iwi, no tamaki makaurau a hau, Ko Horace Brown Rawa, ko Raihia Redford, o ko Tipuna. E mihi mahana kia koutou. Um, thank you very much for um, coming out this evening to be here um, for these proceedings. Um, at the outset, um, I'd like to acknowledge the role of my colleagues, my collaborators, um, and students in particular, for actually leading me to this point. I, I didn't go unled. Um, and I'd like to express my particular, very special appreciation for the Māori staff from across the university, um, who have embraced and nurtured me from my earliest days here, initially via the Māori arm of the um, tertiary union, um, and also by Afi Mai Afi Atu, um, in the last 10 or 11 years um, through Te Pautama Māori and on our many other ventures as well. Um, but most of all, I'd like to salute the steadfast perseverance with me um, of Mark, Daisy, Jed, my parents um, and Fano. Um, why, you may ask, are we here? I'm, I'm not speaking philosophically. <laughs> I mean, literally, why are we here? Um, IPLs are never presented here, so why? Well, it's because identity in place matters. This is the lecture theatre that I've done most of my lecturing in over the last 20 years. It's a place I identify with, although I wouldn't go so far as to say I feel at home here. <laughs> But my lecture tonight is all about identity in place, so the place matters. Another place. Um, that's Bastion Point in the circle. Uh, this is Auckland. Forty years ago to the year, a large fleet of army lorries and jeeps, many, many, many of them, growled through central Tamaki Makaro, Auckland, to reinforce 700 police officers in expelling protesters on ancestral Māori land in the heart of inner suburbia, less than eight kilometres from downtown. In 1976, the Crown had announced its intention to allow development on the remaining land at Takaparafa, Bastion Point, for prestigious waterfront housing. This was the last 25 hectares of Crown land at Orake, and the hapu had hoped it would be returned. 
By way of protest against this high-end development proposal, the Uraki Māori Action Committee occupied temporary housing for 506 days on that land. That is until this. 222 of the protesters were arrested for trespassing on these ancestral lands of Ngāti Whātua, and temporary meeting house, buildings and gardens were demolished. The politics of the situation were complicated. However, the occupation confronted New Zealanders more powerfully than ever before with a legacy of colonial domination in the urban context. The completely fraught, enduring, haunting history of the land around this Orake or Kahu Bay area tells a damning story about how the city of Auckland was created and has continued to be reproduced over time. I was a school kid living less than two kilometres away from all of this activity as it took place. I was cognizant of the tormenting history of Tangata Whenua being deliberately displaced from their Turanga Waiwai and identity at Orake as part of a century-long colonial praxis of dispossession and displacement. As I saw all of this unfold, it seemed to me that the ongoing politics of place and power injustices linked to the control of space were among the most important issues you could seek to unveil in our society. So this provided a deeply challenging agenda for my undergraduate studies, uncovering the importance of place in the maintenance of cultural identity, revealing the power relations evident in the practices surrounding space, but then envisioning, hopefully, transformation that would facilitate the aspirations of decolonization in this area. Thus, the subjects of geography and planning seemed like two obvious starting points for my life at university. Amongst other things, the discipline of geography is a primary pathway to revealing and explaining such complexities of power, particularly in regard to place and identity, space and social justice. The discipline of planning, on the other hand, has the mandate to evaluate options for transformation in place and space, seeking practical ways forward in terms of advancing social and physical sustainability. So my talk tonight is positioned within these two disciplines. So now let me explain my talk's title, in case you didn't get it. Um, and my aims in the presentation. Um, so the title, the concept of whakawhanaki tanga toitu is the notion of developing and improving our activities and lives in a way that is sustainable for the long term. So it's kind of like sustainable development, if you like. And I'm especially focusing tonight on the cultural sustainability in an urban context. As for the subtitle, A Tale of Two Cities, I'm not in this instance thinking about two physically separate cities, although I do happen to have examples from two locations today in Tamaki Makaurau, Auckland, and Otatahi, Christchurch. But in this instance, the way that I'm thinking of two is in the term meaning to remain or setting in place. So the difference that I'm interested in highlighting today are not so much across space, but across time. That is, the changes occurring in long-established cities that are dynamic over time and remain in need of further transformation in order to achieve development that is actually culturally sustainable. And I intend to convey two principal messages today regarding priorities as I see them, and those are the two listed in the bottom part of the slide. The first is about enabling Māori students to be mātauranga Māori leaders on campus, sorry, learners on campus, both actually. Um, that is, offering a teaching and learning environment specifically for Māori students, not merely teaching students who happen to be Māori. And then my second point is about the need for envisioning te ao Māori and mātauranga Māori within the city itself. These two elements are deeply intertwined in my activities at the university. So by way of contextualizing the first message, 
about enabling Māori students. I want to list a few examples of many that I could draw on, copious numbers that I could draw on from my own experience. These echo the stories I receive from our Māori alumni on a regular basis. They are stories of being the isolated person of Māori descent in the workforce, whether by choice or at the urging of others. As the sole Māori presence, we are the go-to person for all things Māori. For example, as an undergraduate student, I was told, oh, it would be really good if you could organise a trip to the local marae for your class, even though you're not a tutor or a demonstrator in that course. As a regional government employee, I was told, you would be the appropriate person to work on identifying the social impact assessment issues with local iwi, even though you'd never worked on impact assessment before. As a city council employee, I was told, the local iwi environmental agency is wanting someone to facilitate their development of an iwi management plan. We think you're that person, <laughs> even though you've not had any experience at facilitating anything. <laughs> and then on the second day at work here, I was told, we have a brand new Māori PhD student working on a topic that's well outside your area of expertise. <laughs> but we consider you would be the best person to be the primary supervisor. Now, being channeled willingly or by surprise into Māori-related avenues has been par for the course for me, as it is for our Māori alumni. And on one level, that's fine. Many such activities are at the heart of what I might consider my calling. Yet on another level, it's also complicated in that these are often situations in which I'm not set up to succeed precisely because I am a lone voice, or there's situations in which I lack the matauranga to be culturally secure, or there are additional tasks that add to my overflowing cup of such opportunities. As a university, I think it's important to recognise this reality for our Māori students. Māori students and alumni are called on by iwi and hapu, by employers or at their own instigation to facilitate Māori-related development, to be Māori in their learning and working lives. There is a weight of expectation on them from the workplace and from Māori communities that is different to what our other students experience. And we as a university can and should expedite their confidence and success in being Māori graduates of our institution, not just graduates of our institution. And we can do that by contextualising our teaching to the place in which we live, embracing disciplinary related mātauranga expertise. We should be encouraging these students to be Māori here, ensuring they maintain their integrity as Māori students, as Māori academic thinkers, all the while located in this Pākehā institution. The more mātauranga competent students we have graduating, the less likely the isolated employee. And making inroads in this necessitates more mātauranga competent academics within every discipline in institutions like ours, proportional to our increasing Māori student in intake. So to help me work towards this, because I don't necessarily achieve it, but I work towards this, um, in terms of my teaching and learning related to Māori geographies and planning, a framework for my teaching activities is depicted in this artwork by Daisy, my daughter here. Um, thank you, Daisy. It starts in the middle with Iho Whenua, which some of you will know is the name that we were gifted as a department for our department, which is symbolic of the union between people, environment, and identity. Significantly, Whenua is both the word for the unborn child's placenta and also the word for the land. Both are united by the delivery of the baby's Whenua back to the earth after the birth of the child. This is a practice that permanently connects the child with the land or place in which they belong. Your identity is in place, the place of your ancestors. That connection between people and the land is a disciplinary space in which I work, a, dovet a dovetailing of environment and people. The fern fronds in this artwork denote kaitiakitanga or guardianship and whakamanawa or giving confidence to students in their endeavors. 
These PO are my dual aims of fostering understanding of our natural and physical environment and inspiring people to develop the confidence and passion to act as stewards for it. The overarching element depicted above the fronds, whakateri, means navigating or finding a way forward. That is, working with students to uphold the precious connection between people and place. Enhancing the environment that we leave for our mukapuna, it involves encouraging the appreciation of Māori ways of knowing and what that means for managing our natural and physical environment. Then on to my second message. My second message relates to envisioning te ao Māori and mātauranga Māori in the city, or reclaiming indigenous identity in place. This is one of the main strands, but not the only strand, of my research activity. And by way of introducing my research, let me start by recounting how I established the focus for my PhD. In the 1990s, I was working in plan planning practice in Tamaki Makaurau, Auckland, on urban growth management in the East Tamaki Corridor. We, as local authority city planners, were presented by developers and consultants with well-formed conceptual plans to establish urban villages in this quickly growing urban periphery location. The urban village is a British, a British form of compact nodal urban development, characterised by medium density housing, mixed land uses and activities, and the use of traditional local vernacular architecture. Urban villages have had an exponential increase in popularity around the world in the last 30 years. However, their adoption into planning policy and then construction on the ground was undertaken swiftly and prolifically in a really uncritical manner. My question was, are such urban, villages, are such urban village notions a contextually appropriate development option in South Auckland? Where did these ideas originate? Who developed them? What was the intent behind them? Planning is never purely technical and it's never neutral. So what would such an approach to growth management in South Auckland mean for local aspirations and equity and in our treaty context? Was this just another fashionable colonial practice uplifted from Britain of which, of which we should be very wary? So I left planning practice in the midst of that and undertook a PhD in the UK examining up close and really personal all the founders of this idea and their foundations and the implications of this urban village model. It seemed fundamental to invest, investigate the social relations that were implicated in this redesign of the urban landscape of South Auckland. The conservative, authoritarian, controlling ideology that I uncovered warned of the ease with which Aotearoa New Zealand was again slipping into the further embedding of colonial models in contemporary urban activities. Our planning and policy practitioners in this country need to be aware of the ingrained entanglements when they endorse a model like that of the urban village. The urban village concept is integrally connected to complex ideological processes and social and moral enterprises. But in our country, a critical part of urban planning is running processes that give expression to our unique cultural context and heritage, and ensuring that our built environment reflects, among other things, the values and aspirations of Māori communities, or at least it should be. So I was now acutely aware firsthand of the need to increase the capacity of Aotearoa's municipal and environmental decision makers and officials in terms of te ao Māori and mātauranga Māori if decolonisation of our planning thinking in this country was to be achieved meaningfully. So subsequently, as both Mark and I were completing our doctorates overseas, we decided that we would seek jobs back in New Zealand and in particular seek jobs in Otipoti, Dunedin, which we had identified and thus targeted. <laughs> <laughs> On our checklist, it made the top of the list. Um, I had simultaneous job offers from the Otago Regional Council and the University of Otago, but which would be the best vehicle for achieving transformation and planning practice in this country? 
well, we both made the decision to head to the University of Otago, having actually applied upon seeing two side-by-side -side job vacancies in the Otago Bulletin. Um, and then we were later phoned to be told of our success within 10 minutes of each other. <laughs> Um, and so we've both been here for nearly 20 years. We're incredibly stable, <laughs> but highly dynamic as well. <laughs> so in reality, it was the potential of teaching a decolonizing effort, ethic that placed me in the university. In response to my decade in planning practice and the findings of my doctorate, this job choice was a deliberate quest to work with those who are about to embark on becoming our nations and other nations' environmental planning advisors and decision makers. That is, Māori for whom the potential of decolonisation could be unlocked, non-Māori who could be challenged to understand the practical implications of partnership under the treaty, and non-Māori and international students who could be attuned to what it means to more than merely hear the calls of Indigenous peoples around the world. So in the last 20 years, my teaching and research have been intricately interlaced. This means I find it really hard to undertake any research that doesn't overtly connect the goal of transforming of transforming professional practice. So perhaps my activities is, are just as much teaching-led research as opposed to research-led teaching. Okay, so what I want to do now is give you a taste of the broader picture of the research that I've been undertaking since arriving in Aotearoa, Dunedin. Um, the research I've used together here today has all been part of collaborative and mostly transdisciplinary, or perhaps we could think of it as holistically oriented efforts with other academics across multiple departments, particularly Māori academics across multiple departments, um, and Māori communities, and also a lot of time with Māori graduate students that I work with, many of whom are here. Together, we work with tangata whenua groups in seeking to achieve their aspirations for urban and papakaianga development, cultural landscape stewardship, indigenous impact assessment, and the guardianship of the natural and physical environment. Let me start by outlining the failure of planning. Planning systems around the world have both directly and indirectly marginalized and oppressed indigenous peoples. So it has been near impossible for indigenous groups to achieve their aspirations. The degree of indigenous involvement in planning has been widely discussed internationally in the last two decades due to the ongoing underrepresentation of indigenous groups in any planning processes. A key focus has been the failure of the conventional planning processes to acknowledge, respect, and understand indigenous knowledges, values and interests appropriately. In addition, ongoing colonial practices have restricted the rights of indigenous groups to plan, protect and partake in planning. Colonization has pushed aside indigenous ethics and languages to such a degree that it's actually very difficult for indigenous groups to even imagine how best to reaffirm their traditional principles and practices in a way that will be influential in achieving outcomes. Yet indigenous groups' responsibilities for their local environment remain. Whoever happens to own the land or whatever the legal framework. To a substantial extent, any attempts to achieve indigenous participation have been based on the notion that indigenous groups will contribute via the conventional options the Western bureaucratic system has in place, thus often rendering the permitted involvement quite tokenistic. Participation that requires conforming to bureaucratic practices and timetables, demanding a form of communication that may be unfamiliar and culturally dismissive, necessarily erects a barrier to genuine, respectful engagement. Similarly, for the last century and a half in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Māori communities have had to live with a Western system of environmental management and planning as a part of the colonial enterprise, and that has set aside and ignored traditional roles and practices that Māori communities have long undertaken in the environment. 
this more than disappointing global and local situation provides me with ample motivation to address the fact that democratic legal and planning systems have struggled to cater for meaningful planning in, with, and by indigenous groups. Yet in attempting to rectify this travesty, there is a good deal of creative energy actually required to translate indigenous knowledge into 21st century development and planning. For example, it is clear that the directions being taken by EU and hapu in relation to such activity are derived from long-standing traditional values that are being re-engaged for the contemporary context. In the research I've been involved in, we have had an explicit intention of communicating the creative potential of indigenous culture encountering the influence of colonization and ubiquitous global practices. In so doing, we aim to deliver an appreciation of indigenous understandings that can be incorporated into a re-energized willingness for meaningful relationships between Māori, resource users, and decision-making agencies. Critical to this endeavor is the recognition that Māori conceptualizations of the environment are vastly different to Western ones. The integrated understanding that Māori communities have of landscapes, ancestors, events, histories and practices deeply challenges conventional, contemporary, colonial processes in Aotearoa, New Zealand. In particular, as is typical of many colonial societies, the presence of indigenous groups has long been rendered invisible in Aotearoa's urban fabric. Moving through the built environment of our cities, you would generally have no hint of an indigenous present manifest in the city. This is indicative of the marginalization of indigenous voices, names, histories, landmarks, practices, and symbolism in the business as usual practices of city planning. Nevertheless, recent years have seen some examples of meaningful effort in planning thinking and practice to understand indigenous values as well as some innovative undertakings by indigenous communities in working towards their own urban aspirations. Yes, Māori communities' involvement in planning has long been hindered by a legacy of ignorance towards their taha wairua, spiritual well-being, and mātauranga, and counter-colonial interests that they have. However, such ignorance has been incrementally destabilized recently through things like political decentralization, the introduction of a more minority conscious electoral system under MMP, and resource management and local government reforms that have, that have advocated a more community inclusive approach to planning and increased accountability in terms of implementation of the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. So, specifically, what is being done to reinsert indigenous aspirations in our supposedly post-colonial urban environments? How do we achieve the co-creation of urban environments so that they also do reflect indigenous identities? We need to reimagine the urban landscape as rich with indigenous identity, values, and principles. These values are intricately linked to philosophies from long-held and intimate relationships between people and place, the iho whenua whakapapa connection. Māori worldviews are holistic and cyclic. All humans are interconnected to all living things and to the spiritual realm, interwoven by whakapapa, like a kind of 3D, multifaceted, multi-layered genealogy. The profound relationship that Māori have with the surrounding environment provides the basis of Māori practices and is underpinned by Māori creation narratives. The Ranganui and Papatua Nuku narratives explain the creation of the physical world and all things within it. These narratives emphasize the connection between Māori communities and the natural and spiritual environment by describing the world as a vast and interlinking family tree from which Māori descend. As a result, this relationship has influenced social cond conduct for many generations and guided how tangata whenua interact with the environment. Papatua Nuku nourishes all humankind and all other living things, and concomitantly, the duty of care for the environment belongs to the Māori community. 
It is an obligation to act as kaitiaki or guardians and respect and care for ancestors and their environment for the generations to come. Māori communities possess both an embedded responsibility towards and a unique knowledge base about the natural, physical and spiritual environment. And currently, Māori-led urban design and planning practice, for example, is playing a really significant role in reconnecting the indigenous past with ever-evolving contemporary urbanisation. In doing so, these accomplishments are articulating a somewhat lost right to the city that is now reshaping urban experience for all residents, not just Māori residents. For Māori communities, the built environment is not simply about physical spaces, rather it is an expression and extension of identity. Physical surrounds are inseparable from ancestors, events, practices and context. So Māori development activity is holistic in conception. Let's have a look briefly at what that can look like. Tamaki Makaurau, Auckland. A really inspirational model of contemporary transformation addressing such issues is now emerging on that site of historic controversy at Takaparafa Bastion Point, just eight kilometres from downtown in the centre of Auckland Isthmus. A medium density development by Ngāti Whātua or Ōrāke has been designed as a traditionally, ex traditionally inspired environmentally and socially sustainable project that aims to attract and to accommodate hapu members back onto these ancestral lands. The master plan development this community has undertaken is located on land that the hapu bought back from the Crown in 1996. It is an inner city suburb surrounded by some of the most upmarket waterfront housing in the city. The hapu is creating a comprehensive development based on customary values and principles that will enhance the political, the social, cultural, spiritual, environmental and economic conditions of the Ngāti Whātua community. This is now being facilitated by a special purpose activity zone within the Auckland District Plan, a plan change initiated by Ngāti Whātua themselves that facilitates tribal re-establishment on ancestral land and according to, really importantly, according to preferred tribal lifestyle. It recognises that Ngāti Whātua should be able to use its ancestral land in a manner that provides for tribal needs and aspirations. In order to arrive at the development plan for the site, Ngāti Whātua Trust Board ran more than 30 hapū meetings plus educative sessions and workshops, way more than the city councils ever run when they're trying to work out their plans. <laughs> These established the planning process, the conceptual ideas, the preferred living environments and the customary principles that would guide development, including the following principles. The principle of kotahitanga, or collaboration and cohesion, prioritising things like community facilities and amenities, making sure that they included health clinics, for example, making sure they included educational environments, um, and providing natural, cultural and leisure amenities in the area. A second principle was that of wairuatanga, or soul, ensuring development orientation faces towards important landmarks and ancestors, for example. A third principle was manakitanga, or hospitality, guaranteeing access to traditional food sources to enable generous hospitality, and there's been a lot done on site to enable the growth of natural food sources again. Whanaungatanga, membership, creating places that reflect identity, providing heritage markers, providing community-oriented housing and gardens where people can live in community with each other. Fifth principle, kaitiakitanga, or guardianship and stewardship. This has included things like achieving restoration of waterways and natural areas, using passive design, creating on-site mitigation of grey water and stormwater, ensuring careful use of rainwater and solar energy, clustering buildings to maximise communal reserves and restoration of natural features. 
And then a sixth principle of rangatiratanga about self-determination and independence, promoting self-sufficiency within the development of the site, and with that, creating employment prospects and home occupation opportunities on site. The resulting development, which is under construction but not yet completed, also includes apartments, low-rise townhouses, detached elders' housing, shared courtyards, orchards, shared vegetable gardens, community buildings, and some play space, among other amenities. Potentially 6,500 member families will live on the site, and new financial arrangements have been put in place to ensure tribe members can actually afford to live in this really posh part of Auckland. Members who buy houses will lease them for 150 years, with a tribe-based corporate system being set up to run the development in place of the conventional body corporate system New Zealand operates. This is all part of a goal to reinvigorate the location as the heart of the hapu. So such attainments are a far cry from the displacing land confiscations, evictions, protests and demolitions that litter the urban history of this very landscape at Takaparafa. Contemporary activities on this site represent an indigenous community-centered resurgence, defending homelands against colonialism with integrity. Achieving that within the urban setting is no mean feat, especially in Auckland. Then my second location is Ōtutahi Christchurch. And this is a really exciting project as well and internationally groundbreaking in terms of what they're undertaking. It's the progress that's taking place in the city in particular that I'm interested in in response to post-earthquake earthquake reconstruction of the central area. There have been several mechanisms for change that have been used as part of the process of reinventing the city and counter to the likelihood of the urgency of planning after a major disaster, meaning that participatory practices are diminished, in certain regards, the replanning of Ōtutahi Christchurch has actually led to enhanced participatory options for Ngaitahu. Ngaitahu, as the local um, iwi, were quick to respond to the earthquake in t earthquakes in terms of establishing immediate relief efforts and also in terms of brokering relationships between key services and stakeholders to get the city running again. In addition, further to existing statutory requirements for engagement with Māori in planning processes and the expanded obligations for roles in decision-making post Naitahu's treaty settlement in 1998, the Tangata have been formally represented at most levels of the temporary earthquake recovery governance systems that have been set up in the city. This has involved multiple types of engagement, including with the main tribal body, the Naitahu Earthquakes Recovery Group, the Tribes Health Agency, the local, local Mana Whenua Urban Design Agency, the main local sub-tribal communities, the Environmental Consultancy of the six local sub-tribal groups, and the Joint Management Board Partnership between Naitahu, the Recovery Agency, and the City Council. The various Naitahu bodies have recognised the reconstruction period as an opportunity to bring about change, inclusivity and a real sense of belonging. Up until this time, many Māori in Christchurch saw no reflection of their culture in the city, the city which is located within their territory. In material terms, the result has been reconstruction that better interweaves traditional language, for example. Better interweaves traditional design and arts. Includes reconfiguring natural heritage and the recovery of natural resources. That's for dinner, by the way. <laughs> and reintroduces local narratives and important Maori values and aspirations as well. This is a really significant shift, particularly for this city, 
uh, is massive. While planning administration became centralised through the recovery process, the government and the tribe both used the recovery as an opportunity to connect local government and Ngaitahu as partners. This is a move that has enhanced Indigenous influence as compared to conventional practices in the city up until the 2010-11 earthquakes. What is clear in the redevelopment of the city is that the growing engagement, both vertical in terms of up and down different tiers of government and horizontal via an array of different agencies, is very successfully weaving into the urban fabric key tribal values such as identity, hospitality, autonomy and spiritual calling, as well as historical and contemporary connections with land, waterways, and treasures in the city. We are witnessing in Ōtutahi Christchurch's rebuild development being woven, into the, being woven into the city that is more meaningful and respectful of Ngaitahu lived experiences, narratives and practices. Nevertheless, <laughs> The construction of the city, the city is still highly contested in terms of whose narratives are told or retold and whose are not. And the assorted tensions in the process reinforce the critical importance of indigenous groups being around the decision-making table across all layers of governance. So what we have in these two very different city examples in Auckland and Christchurch are first an illustration of a tangata whenua community creating a traditionally founded living environment for the hapu in Auckland. And secondly, a multifaceted approach to giving voice and visibility to Māori presence across the city of Christchurch. We see an innovative interweaving of traditional and contemporary urban design we see a reclaiming of Māori spatial narratives in the city. We can observe the re-establishing of the cultural presence of Māori in the city in these two distinct ways, in these two different locations. Now, will non-Indigenous citizens actually notice the difference? they may recognise a difference in the process that has been used for governance and decision making, possibly not. They may notice a difference in the principles and values that are driving some development in the city. They may appreciate the difference in the symbolism around the city. Some overt art and sculpture is visible to all. However, the narratives behind them may be subtle enough to remain known only to some. Does it matter? Not all processes and outcomes need to be understood by everybody. But as an indigenous group, being able to recognize your identity in the city is critical. That is being able to be yourself and see yourself in the city that you inhabit. Crucially though, such indigenous transformation also has implications for dominant society, which itself needs to be informed and even reformed by the challenges emerging from the indigenous world. So back to the idea of two cities, TU cities, cities across time, the colonial city that was and the reclaimed city that is becoming. The examples I've highlighted demonstrate the tremendous potential for interlacing traditional and present day practices of urbanization, re-establishing the cultural imperative and presence of indigenous groups in cities, and concomitantly improving the prospects for more socially and culturally sustainable urban environments. Transforming the city, reinventing the city, Reclaiming the city of many histories, not just certain groups' histories. We see that the contemporary approach by Māori communities to planning and development is not unrehearsed. Rather, development is being considered against a long legacy of constitutional struggles and sustained adherence to traditional values and practices. 
The notion that Māori are partners in decision making about the natural and physical environment is key to understanding iwi and hapu approaches that have been developed. The fact that Māori were dispossessed of ownership of practically all land has not obviated their sense of responsibility for decisions that affect land and water in their localities, in the cities within their rohi. In this, Māori are at a point that is similar to many other indigenous peoples around the world. Internationally, decades of effort have gone into securing mere recognition and then, in some cases, attempting to shift beyond that to self-determination through collective self-affirmation. Recent strategies adopted by a number of indigenous activist First Nations groups in Canada are moving past a focus on their position in relation to the colonial state and instead towards fashioning their own decolonizing practices of freedom. That is, not being trapped in an endless seeking of recognition and empowerment from the state, rather being liber liberated by their own transformative practice, praxis. The challenge is to be a provocative and constructive contributor to the potential implementa implementation of an interrupted, re-envisaged urbanity, an urbanity that can embrace diversity courtesy of genuine plurality in its realization. So at the core of my research is the belief in decolonization, making sense of indigenous understandings, furthering indigenous aspirations, while also seeking to change priorities held in the seats of power. I have transformative hopes. I have hope that decision makers will grow in their willingness to learn and cherish other ways of knowing. They will seek to understand other ways of knowing. I have hope that decision makers will be involved in the capacity building of dominant society, not the capacity building of indigenous groups, the capacity building of dominant society to support and understand indigenous aspirations for cities, landscapes and environments. I have hoped that decision makers will be involved in redressing current power imbalances and developing mechanisms that are meaningful for genuine partnership. And I have hoped that we will embrace indigenous cultural and environmental knowledges in order to shift from a, to shift from a privileging of the majority to a coexistence of self-determining peoples. And of course, to help achieve these hopes over the long haul, as an institution here at Otago, we need to grow graduates who are competent in Māori sciences and understandings so they can lead us in that change. We need to have a diversity of academic staff who are able to teach beyond Western science to other ways of knowing, staff who can inspire genuine and meaningful Māori contributions to society and from our Māori graduates, not solely educate students, some of whom might happen to be Māori in Western paradigms. An ethic of locatedness is critical to learning and working outcomes in the Aotearoa New Zealand context. That involves learning and research in initiatives that reassert the potency and the integrity of indigenous philosophies and actions. That involves considering how we might honor variation in indigeneity through our teaching and investigative practices. In our university, we need to foster learning environments where indigenous knowledge, culture, and values are recognized as normal and absolutely legitimate, where being indigenous being Māori is normal. It's about creating space within all our university disciplines, all of them, for distinctive indigenous learning and intellectualism. The trajectory of our ambitions at Otago is really positive. The implementation needs to catch up a bit though, to move us towards Faka Fanaki Tanga Toitu. Now just a um, publicity stunt here. If <laughs> 
<laughs> taken by surprise back there. Um, if these sorts of in issues interest you, you may like to attend our department's public lecture on Wednesday night as well, which is presented by the wonderful Professor Livy Porter, sitting right there in the middle, um, who's visiting us from RMIT in Melbourne. Kanui tenei, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. I'm Tony Ballantyne of the PBC Humanities, and it is with great pleasure that I'll deliver a vote of thanks to Michelle. I think we'll all agree that she has given a, a truly excellent lecture, providing rich insights into the commitments that frame her research, and sharing some important reflections on the power of geography and planning to shape our society and its possible futures. The relationships between space, place, and social difference have stood at the heart of Michelle's talk. She has reminded us that we live within places and spaces that were remade by colonization, and that those processes have created fundamentally uneven cultural frameworks for our lives here in Te Waipanamu and Te Ikao Maui. She observed that planning is never purely technical and that it is not neutral. It has great power to influence how space is organized and how social relationships work on the ground. Her lecture has also made a strong argument about the ways in which bureaucratic practices and the common assumptions of participatory democracy frame Māori communities as stakeholders and how these have worked to sign-line hapu and iwi and contain and manage Māori difference and the power of rangatiratanga. This evening, Michelle has made a really positive case for planning as an agent of transformation. It can be something that empowers if we move beyond business as usual and recognise the weight and significance of mātauranga Māori and mana whenua status. This would be a decolonised planning, a set of practices that could help reshape our places and our politics a way of more fully realising our locatedness. I think one of the great moments of the lecture was M Michelle using Daisy's Iho Whenua image to imagine this kaupapa, to render its values visible to all of us. 
Uh, I'd also really like to, to highlight the challenge that Michelle's thrown down to us. She has reminded us all of the centrality of students to the university. She has talked about something that we haven't heard much about before, which is teaching-led research. Uh, and she's reminded us of the vital role that we have in the university as professionals in challenging established ideas and enabling student achievement and in supporting the success of Māori students as Māori. To my mind, one of the most powerful dimensions of this lecture has been setting out the very strong connections between teaching, research and professional practice as we try and unpack the legacies of the colonial past. Michelle is a brilliant teacher, an inspirational supervisor, and we're very lucky to have her help us through those conversations in the coming years. So Michelle, you've done a great job and it is terrific that we can all be here together with you to celebrate your promotion and your fantastic contribution to your department, to our division and to the university as a teacher and researcher. I had something I've prepared a little earlier. I didn't really, but I have a... I have a gift to give to Michelle, so could you please join in congratulating her, thanking her, and I'd like you all to follow uh, to a little function in the staff club. Thank you very much. Thank you.